Um, can I ask quickly, a quick show of hands, I mean, how many people here are familiar with Kanban, they use Kanban regularly and, and so on? That's good. Um, how many people are here, so how many people are here to hear you know, perhaps a different way of, of explaining Kanban, of thinking about Kanban and so on? Um, which is kind of where I started, that's good. Um, how many people are here to hear an introduction to Kanban? Yep. Now, hopefully, this talk will work for both sets of people. Um, I, I wrote it out of some frustration with the way that, that Kanban was presented. I mean, David said uh, in his keynote um, that there's this myth that the Kanban, is the Kanban method is only about, you know, boards, sticky notes, Kanban systems, and, and, it, and it is rather more than that. Um, I will explain that stuff in this talk, but I'm going to hopefully get to some of, the, uh, some of those other things in a way that is, is actionable as well. Uh, so, Kanban through its values. Uh, we'll come to the Kanban is like onions title, the, the sort of working title of this talk, um, and, a, and the title of a blog post um, in, a, in a few slides. Um, so, I'm really just answering the question, what is Kanban? Um, and just to uh, make it harder for myself, uh, add a bit of creative constraint. Um, I'm not going to mention any of these words, productivity, efficiency, effectiveness, multitasking, or waste. A um, bit shocking to you know, come to a lean conference and not hear someone talk about waste. Um, really avoid the, the Japanese jargon. Again, that can be you know, a, le a, lean, a lean foible, shall we say. Obviously, the word Kanban itself is, uh, is a Japanese word. Um, if I remember, I'll explain what it means in a moment. Um, and the other thing is that I'm not here to bash what everybody else is doing. I'm not here to bash Scrum in particular. I'm generous to, towards what you do now. Kanban is the start with what you do now method, after all. Um, so Kanban could be described as, and this is perhaps the, the textbook definition, an evolutionary approach to change. And it really is a, a textbook definition, perhaps a rather technical definition. You know, if you know what evolutionary uh, development means or evolutionary change means, um, then you probably don't, uh, you know, you, you, you probably know Kanban already. Um, so that's not so helpful. What I will do is instead describe Kanban as, Kanban as the humane, start with what you do now approach to change. And as I explain it that way, we'll actually kind of as a side effect explain that first definition. So this is what I've been doing since about January. I wrote a blog post called Introducing Kanban Through Its Values. Um, and my talks, uh, the way I teach Kanban, has, has changed very significantly this, this year since writing that post. Can I do a quick show of hands? Who, 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 who here has actually read that post? I know, I know a few people have. Um, a system of nine values. Now, nine is actually quite a, diff a list of nine things is actually quite hard to remember. Um, so I've organized it into three groups of three. And the first group are the first three values, transparency, balance, and collaboration. And they're all about driving change. Uh, next one, customer focus, flow, and leadership. Those are all about the direction that we take change in. And lastly, a layer called discipline. You know, this is working agreements, leadership dis discipline. This is things like understanding, agreement, and respect. So we'll, we'll look at those, those first three, the, the drive ones. These are the ones that, if you're new to Kanban, these will be the ones that you're most familiar with already, probably. So we start with transparency. And that is based on three of Kanban's core practices. Visualize, make policies explicit, implement feedback loops. And transparency, a large, large part of that is making work visible, making knowledge work visible in particular. Now, knowledge work is a funny thing. You know, it exists up here in our heads. It lives on our, on our computers. Uh, you walk into an office full of knowledge workers, you can't actually see the work. Um, Kanban changes that. You know, we put it up on the wall. You know, we may use electronic systems, but, but when we do that, um, it works really well to, you know, put that on a large screen that everyone can see, that people can meet around and, and so on. So we're making it visible. And we're organizing the work. And I want to stress that we're organizing the work, not people. We're making the different types of work visible. That's with the colors in this. In this. this is quite a simple board, but it's representative. So types of work represented by color. And what the work needs is represented by the, the columns that the work is sitting in. So this is a development process, software development process. So what work me needs are things like uh, software needs to be built, it needs to be tested, it needs to be delivered, implementation steps, and so on. And those columns uh, describe those. Um, and that's about all you need to know to start with. So we're making the knowledge work, work visible. I stressed we're organizing the work. In organizing the work, we make it possible for people to organize themselves around it. And this is what self-organization is all about. Um, 
there's a myth, that mis a myth or a misunderstanding that self-organization is just about personal effectiveness. It's the ability of, you know, it's about autonomy. You know, it's about people being good at managing themselves. That's only a small part of what self-organization is all around, about. It's a, a, about the ability of whole systems to reorganize themselves, to reconfigure themselves. It brings resilience, as well as those humane benefits, the autonomy and so on. So we get people to organize themselves around the work, a group of people looking at the board and together facing the challenges of the day or you know, facing the challenges of the, of, of the project and starting to build shared understanding and giving people the opportunity to think about what is the best way for us to organize ourselves in order to, to deliver what needs to be delivered. So that's self-organization. And when we self-organize around the work, we actually may think, well, actually, the way we've organized the work isn't actually as good as it could be. Um, you know, we're, we're thinking about work in the wrong way. We've got the wrong process, or the process is capable of being improved. Um, and with Kanban, you know, changing the process is a really easy and really visual thing to do. You know, we rub out a line on the board, we move a few stickers around, and now we're describing, describing the process either as it now is, or as it was, or as we want it soon to be. Um, if we use an electronic system, again, a few clicks with a mouse, drag a few virtual post-its around on the screen, and we've reorganized the work. So this is a very high leverage activity, something that takes moments, may potentially have a profound impact on the way that the, uh, way the, way the process works. And we've captured learning by changing the design of the board. Hi, Jose. Didn't realize there was an entrance there. Of course, the, the visual language of uh, sticky notes, colors, columns, horizontal swim lanes, you know, various more complicated grid arrangements and so on, can take us only so far. You know, sometimes it's actually useful to use words to describe what the constraints of the process are, and we call those policies in Kanban. Now, a very important uh, class of policy are the definitions of done, that we can apply either to the whole process or to um, individual stages in the process. So what we're uh, try again trying to avoid doing is organizing people. We don't say to people, you must do that, then that, then that, within the scope of a particular activity. What we should be describing are uh, what we expect, what kind of state we expect the work in uh, when it's ready to move from one stage to another. So what's done for one stage, what's ready for the next stage, and so on. Um, so it's, it's kind of a declarative approach, if you're familiar with that concept from, from programming. Policies aren't only definitions of done, they can be more global things. And here's a global policy um, that I found very effective in my, during my management career. Uh, when priorities need to change, inform the people affected. Um, affected. Um, you may be familiar with the idea of um, certain customers having certain favorite developers and you know, being sort of behind the scenes conversations that cause priorities to be changed in a way that isn't transparent. Now when a priority changes and a developer changes from working on one person's piece of work to another person's piece of work, the first customer um, is likely to be, if, if they're surprised by that change, they're likely to be quite upset. You know, I thought you were working on this, I thought I'd get it t t tomorrow, and now I discover that, uh, that you're not even working on it, what's going on? You know, and I've seen that, that situation um, blow up time and time again. This kind of explicit policy forces the right kind of conversations around priority, not just within the team, but potentially between customers as well. And if you work in a large organization like I did, I was, I, I was development manager for a global trading system in a large bank. You know, you have different customers within, within the organization, um, some prioritization decisions can't, realist can't realistically be made within the team. They need to be made between the customers, between <coughs> the people that hold budgets, uh, between the people whose job it is to, uh, to set priorities and so on. Um, so we, there needs to be some proper conversation. So that's a policy. Another very nice thing about Kanban, we've, we've seen from the way we visualize the work that we know what state each piece of work is in, you know, all the time, every day. And uh, it's great for getting some metrics out. This is a cumulative flow diagram that just charts what state the work is in over time. It's kind of a burn-up chart on steroids is perhaps the, the best way to describe it. If you haven't seen a CFD, but you do know what a burn-up chart is. Um, if I had more time, um, I, would, I would take you through this. This really does tell the story of a, of a project. Um, you see a ballooning of work. You see some big releases. 
Uh, you see the process maturing, you see lead times uh, reducing. If you know how to read a CFD, you've probably spotted all that already. Um, I could spend five minutes telling the story of the project and you would see that um, visualised in the, in the diagram. Feedback loops also mean things like meetings, and they can mean things like stand-up meetings, the way we do replenishment meetings. Uh, David talks about things like the operations review, that's another larger scale um, feedback loop. And when we're thinking about implementing uh, something that we want to have you know, change on the organisation, it's actually worth thinking about the feedback loops that are in place already as well. Uh, and thinking about how what you're doing is going to report into uh, existing feedback mechanisms in your organisation. You can ask yourself, a useful question to ask yourself, is this feedback loop encouraging the right behaviour? And if it isn't, uh, start to think about how you can encourage the feed or change the feedback loop to encourage the right kind of behaviours. And that's going to force you to then engage with people outside your immediate team. Um, this is a stand-up meeting. Many, how, how many here have been in a stand-up meeting? You know, familiar with the idea. Um, more than half of you. Um, to give, this is quite a large one. Uh, there's more people in this meeting than you can actually see in the picture. There's people behind the camera. There are people actually out standing outside in the, in the corridor here. Um, this is our friend Dan Vacanti uh, facilitating. Behind him is a, uh, is a board, Kanban board, with about a million dollars worth of work on it. Um, and it was for a significant you know, multi-month project, you know, years worth of, worth, worth of project. So, um, and this is from mid-2000s. I mean, don't let anyone tell you that Kanban is only for maintenance work or that it was developed only for maintenance work and now we're working out how to use it in uh, you know, larger scale pieces of work. You know, it was doing, we were doing large scale stuff from the beginning. That's a feedback loop. Um, so that's transparency. That's the first of the nine values. I'm not going to spend this much time on each of the values. Transparency is by far and away the, the biggest one of Kanban, but the rest are, are important. The next one is balance, which I get from limit work in progress. You'll see how I get from limit work in progress to balance in, in a moment. Um, but very quickly, let's see how pool systems work, how Kanban systems work. In that box, and there's a number four, and this is a work in progress limit on these, this pair of columns here, and I've blown that up so that you can <coughs> read it. It's highlighted in yellow because we're full to the max on those columns. We've got four pieces of work in the, across those two columns. And when one piece moves out, that creates space. <coughs> no longer highlighted in yellow. And that space allows more work to be pulled in. So it's like one, one out, one in. Um, and that kind of pulls work from right to left. So move, work moves out here, we can pull work uh, from the left, and that's, that's, that's why we call these pool systems. Um, pool systems have some great properties. Uh, we'll um, look at some other properties in a minute, um, but the key property here is quite a humane one, as well as a technical one, that we're balancing demand and, and ca capacity, or balancing demand versus capability. In no column have we got more work than the people interested in that work are capable of dealing with. So we're avoiding, use the technical term, we're avoiding overburdening people. Other types of balance, um, remember I said uh, we use colours to indicate types. So, uh, for example, the yellow pieces of work, those are what I would describe as urgency-driven pieces of work. There isn't a meaningful date associated with them, but the faster we deliver them, the better it will be for our customers. Um, Date-driven, you know, as the name implies, um, there's high impact in terms of develop, develop, delivering them for a particular day. Not much benefit in delivering them early, but probably pain for somebody if they're delivered late. Um, when I was dev manager for this trading system, it's a global bond trading platform at UBS, um, our system was connected to multiple exchanges around the world. Um, the urgency driven work was things like new products, uh, new ways of making money, things that got uh, traders rubbing their hands and all the rest of it. This is, this is going to make us, make us bucket loads. The date-driven work were things like API changes at the exchanges. Now, if the API changes at your exchange and you're not ready for it, you're going to be out of that market and you're going to be losing money that day. It's not just that you, you won't have the ability to, try to, you know, to conduct new business. You've lost the ability to hedge the, your existing positions and so on. It's a potentially risky and dangerous situation to find yourself in. So those date-driven uh, pieces of work were meaningful. But we knew that the value wasn't in those date-driven pieces of work. That's just things we had to do. The value was in those urgency-driven pieces of work. And we had customers mature enough to know um, that it wasn't all about dates. And it was about relative priority, relative urgency, about cost of delay, these kind of, these kind of things. It's a very important thing to balance. 
And if you only have date-driven work, you're probably in a world of pain. Um, I don't know how many people, how many people know that. Um, in particular, if you're in a, you're, you have date-driven work and you've planned up to the eyeballs for lots and lots of date-driven work, and then you get interrupts, um, then that's going to be very, very uncomfortable. Um, I just, you know, just wonder how much unnecessary pain has been inflicted on the IT industry by the idea that every piece of work should have a date attached to it. I'll leave that one with you to think about. Um, other types of balance between short term, medium term, and long term. Um, some, as, as a manager, some of the decisions of which I'm most proud are um, actually deciding to put some short term stuff on the hold in order to deliver some medium or long term um, benefits, some capacity improvements, for example. Um, in one case, I've put what was actually our best developer on the problem of addressing a capacity constraint that was going to hit us hard you know, a few months down the line. Um, you know, when you have customers jumping up and down for functional stuff, for urgency-driven stuff, that's a different, co difficult conversation to have. But I'm, I, you know, I'm proud that I had that conversation and we did the right thing. Long-term stuff as well. There's no point in, um, you know, delivering fantastic stuff today if you're going to be bankrupt tomorrow. Similarly, there's no point in getting all excited about delivering only frameworks, but never delivering any product that actually makes the company any money. So you have to get the right balance between these things. And you have to pay attention in, over the medium term to your capability as well. Um, so that leads to this one. You know, we need a balance between delivery, uh, between improving the system, and doing things that are experimental, things where the actual chances of success are actually quite low. Um, but the payoff when they succeed is, is high. You know, and that can be investigating technologies, it can be investigating bits of the market, and so on. And um, another kind of balance. And this is a balance between the different kinds of stakeholders, and it, and it kind of feeds off the last point as well. Um, you know, we need a balance between delivering to the customer, between improving the system for the benefit of the team, and improving the system to the benefit of the organisation. You know, and, and I think actually a very good test of an improvement is that it benefits all three at the same time. You know, if you, if you do stuff just for the customer and it's at the, it's the expense of the team, it's not going to be sustainable. If we try and make an improvement for the team that makes no economic sense to the organisation, that's not going to stick either. And if you come up with an improvement that, you know, it really plays one off against the other, I'd encourage you to, to stop, think, you know, and see if you can come up with a better way that at least makes it no worse for each of those groups and ideally you know, begins to make things better for all three. That's balance. Um, the third of this group is um, collaboration, which I get from improve collaboratively, which I can never say clearly, evolve experimentally using models and the scientific method. And that's a very, um, quite a long, slightly clunky um, wording of the practice. But we'll focus just on the collaboration start part first. Um, most of you will recognise this collaboration. Um, so this is a creative relationship between two people, you know, a relationship that, you know, really transformed, you know, the, the popular music world and perhaps beyond the popular music world um, in the 60s. Um, I was tiny at the, at the time that this was happening, um, so I was, it kind of passed me by, um, but obviously aware of their impact now. Another one, who recognises these guys? Watson and Crick. So this is the model of DNA in the middle here. So again, two people who um, together solve problems um, that neither of them probably could have solved on their own. So a creative problem-solving relationship. This is a collaboration. It's a thing. It's a relationship. It's not just about being nice in your workplace. You know, it's about something that, that um, you know, has a particular value, a particular meaning. And as well as being a way to improve the process and a way to solve problems, it's actually worth thinking about collaboration as a problem in its own right or a focus for improvement in its own right. So we can look at a process and ask, are these high-quality interactions, are these collaborations between the people in the process, or are we doing low-quality things like throwing things over the fence, doing handovers, waiting for sign-offs, those kind of things. So a good example of that um, in software development is, are we doing a code review where someone writes some software emails it to somebody else, and that person has a look at it and sends back some comments by email, you know, kind of a low-quality interaction. Or are we doing something like pair programming, where two people sit together over a period of time, and there is a shared understanding um, between at least two members of the team as the software evolves. So that's a higher-quality interaction. 
we can also look sort of kind of at our teams and think are there people that are sort of islands that, that never have the opportunity for high quality interaction, never have the opportunity for, for collaboration. You know, is, is there a human cost that we can do something to address? Not, not saying that we, you know, we need to force people into collaboration, but you know, if we're not giving people the opportunity, that is, that's a sad thing. The small prints, uh, the using models and the scientific method. A um, few types of models, internal and external, and models of how things work and how to change them. So um, take, for example, that top right-hand tick, um, external models of how things work. You could say that lean is a model of how things work, you know, understanding flow, um, just in time. You know, so these, this is a model, and this is a model that we can, we can understand and adopt in some way in our internal processes. Model, an understanding of how our actual process works, and our Kanban board is a rep representation, a summary representation of how our process works, but we may have other models of, of how things work in our organisation. And then models of how to change them. The theory of constraints, for example, comes with uh, the, the thinking processes and, and um, other tools for managing change in organisations. Not very Kanban-like in, the, in their philosophy, but they're there and worth understanding. Lean has things like A3, you know, a way for two people to, uh, to, to work on a very high-level description of a change. Um, and an uh, internal example of, of how change works, um, you know, look around you for success stories. How do people successfully make change happen in your organisation? Perhaps there's some patterns there you can follow. The Evolve experimentally part, very briefly, PDCA, quick hands up for who's seen PDCA before. Um, this is kind of the canonical um, improvement cycle. It's often called the Deming cycle, um, although it predates de Deming. Um, maybe maybe Schuhart cycle is a better name. Plan, do, check, act. And the thing to be aware of with these words is that they don't mean what you think they mean until you use the word experiment with them. So plan an experiment, do or conduct an experiment, check on the results, and then act on them. Decide whether the results of the experiment are telling you something important about your process, about your system, whether you need to change, um, change your process, change your system, or whether you need to conduct another experiment based on a different <coughs> hypothesis before you make a change. So that's collaboration, and th those are the three drive, um, three drive ones. Um, can I have a quick time check? Five past ten. Five past ten. Right, I need to get moving. Um, very, very quickly. So think on those. Think about what you do now. If you are using, for example, Scrum, I'm not sort of picking on Scrum. Many of the practices that you're already doing, you could map into those values. You can think about um, transparency, balance. You know quick one to balance. What does Scrum do on balance? How do you, um, for example, limit work in progress in Scrum? With a sprint, okay. And collaboration, I mean collaboration is really at the heart of the Agile Manifesto, I would say. And this is kind of the first of Kanban's change agendas as well. You know, you can think about applying Kanban style transparency and balance to your existing process and see what happens. And this is kind of the, the continuous improvement agenda of Kanban. It has other agendas as well. Um, which we come to. So the next set of values are the direction ones. Customer focus, flow, and leadership. I get customer focus from this practice, manage flow. So clearly I've cheated a bit. So manage flow, seeking smoothness and timeliness, anticipating customer needs. So we'll focus first on the anticipating customer needs part. And a lot of this boils down to a very simple thing, knowing what you're delivering, to whom, and why. Now, I use that line when I'm doing training, uh, and often um, this is the line that people remember most. I did a, a class in Geneva a few months ago, and even the next day at coffee breaks, people were coming up to me saying, you know, I was awake at night thinking about this. <laughs> you know, I, I know what I do in terms of what activities I perform, but I just hadn't thought about who I was doing it for and why they wanted it. And um, you know that was a profound change for me. And that, this is in a, in a class of a dozen people. Multiple people came up to me afterwards with, with similar observations. But how do you make that actionable? And this is a, really a story of uh, the way it worked for my development team in Hungary. I was the IT director. It was a UK-owned company, um, but its operations centre and its development team were out in Budapest. I was very frustrated. We kept delivering features that the customers, in the end, didn't want or didn't need. And I thought, I'll show them. We're going to keep the work on the board, 
until they've actually started using it. And if they don't really want it, you know, I'm going to make a fuss about it. Um, so we put this validation column at the end of our, our board. And I've spoken to other people who around the same sort of period, 2009, 2010, were experimenting with a similar thing. Um, this is around the time that Lean Startup was getting going as well, uh, at least at the time that I was aware of it. And um, I was actually stunned at the effect that it had. You know, if you know um, that there's going to be a, an embarrassing conversation at the end of the process, whether you're the developer or the customer, it changes the way you work. So working backwards, and it's a very good thinking tool to work backwards through a Kanban um, board. You know, we, we, you know, are we implementing this in such a way that it's going to hit the ground running, that it's going to work really well from day one? Have we thought about all the configuration that needs to be done, the quality of the data, um, and so on? When we test it, you know, we're testing it with the customer to make sure that it's really going to work for them, it's going to do something useful to them. We do the same thing even during the build stage, you know, showing you know, half-built prototypes and asking, am I along on the right lines? Is this going to work? Is this going to meet your need? And again, right at the beginning, get to what are the real needs of the business? Is this particular request in alignment with those needs? Um, or is it you know, something you know, completely non-strategic, perhaps urgent, or perhaps something that actually we'd be better off not doing at all. So for us, that simple trick of adding a validation column at the end profoundly changed our process. Um, and as a more general point, it's about having, in particular for product development, for software development, um, is understanding the knowledge discovery process, understanding what you need to find out at each stage of the process, um, and really focusing particularly on the customer parts of those for us, had a massive effect on, on, on our understanding and our, and our implementation of the process. And getting to, the, you know, talking about needs that will be met, you know, will it meet the need? You're thinking in terms of the future, not always looking back to the requirement that was originally asked for. It doesn't matter whether you built it to spec. What matters is that in the end is that it's going to meet a need uh, you know, and actually generate some value for the business. I saw this on a plaque on the, on the wall behind the service desk at my local Toyota dealer. I do drive a Toyota. Um, and the last part of the plaque read, anticipating the mo mobility needs of people and society ahead of time. I think that's a great vision for Toyota. And I've highlighted anticipating needs ahead of time. And I would ask you, how good is your process at anticipating the needs of your customers? That's something worth really thinking about. Um, you would be delighted if the services on which you depend anticipate your needs. You know, could you do the same thing for your customers? Um, you, you, know, you really need to, to, to grasp this knowledge discovery process uh, before you're going to be able to do that effectively. That's customer focus. Flow is on the first half of this. Uh, so we're about um, smoothness and timeliness. And mainly I'm going to emphasize just what it feels like. We just watch these, these stickies move across the wall. And you know, a lot about flow is just knowing what to look for, wanting to see it, feeling pain when it's not happening, you know, really not liking it that pieces of work are stuck, either not getting worked on or they're blocked for whatever reason. But we want to see that, that movement to the right. And part of the trick with this is to have pieces of work sized so that we see movement every day. So we've got something, some, something positive to talk about every day, not so tiny that we're just you know, overwhelmed by the, by the detail. Um, this is contextual stuff. I'm not going to say how big your work, work item should be, but if you can't see flow, then think about breaking it down. To keep it visible, value it. There is some sort of deep magic to flow as well. This is, um, all of this is based on que queuing theory, ultimately, and a remarkably simple, beautiful, I'm a mathematician, beautiful result. Um, Little's law, you know, average lead time it, you're over the long term equals the average work in progress over the throughput. Um, with balance, we were intervening at the amount of work in progress we have, but we can do interventions that address unnecessary stages in the process. We can add capacity to the system, and we can be sure that it's going to have an effect on those other quantities. It's, you, know, you, can't, you can't escape the maths. So that's flow. And the last of the direction values is leadership, encouraging acts of leadership at all levels in your organization from individual contributors to senior management. Um, this picture's from the front cover of the Kanban book. And this is a quick show of hands. How many acts of leadership do you see here? I'm seeing a few ones. Any advance on one? Four. 
Well, the answer is it can be any number between one and four. I mean, I think we, we would all agree, let's do something about it, is, is someone showing some, some leadership. Um, we've had some comments. People assume that because this guy's got glasses on, he must be the manager. <laughs> that's, not, that's actually not what it means at all. Um, I actually think he looks about, well, he looks about 20 to me, uh, if age matters. They all look quite young, but I'm, I'm old. Um, but depending on your context, these things can be actually very difficult things to say. Um, there are cultures where admitting that you don't know something that you need help is a hard thing to, to admit. Um, in some cultures, saying that you're busy is actually a badge of pride. Um, in, other, in other cultures, saying I'm busy and I need help you know, may actually take some courage. To say in this current economic climate, I'm idle, well, who wants to say that? You know, when, uh, you know, I, I lived through 18 months of cuts when I was at UBS. You know, I made some of them myself. You know, admitting that you, you didn't have enough work to do in that kind of, kind of context is a very difficult thing, thing to do. So, act, small acts of leadership. And if you look at the Kanban values and at the practices, in every one of them, I won't spell this out now, but you've got time to read this. There's a blog, you can read on my blog, um, small acts of leadership. In every one of these, there's opportunity for, for leadership. In, um, in Toyota, and amongst lean, lean companies around the world, there's a, a particular leadership routine that's quite popular. And this is a kind of a test of your attitude to leadership and management, actually. Now, imagine you are with your team, you're in a large organisation, and a senior director wanders by and asks you these three questions. What's the process? How can we see that it is working? How is it improving? Now, would you be affronted by that, saying, what right have you to ask me that question? You know, we're the guys doing the actual work, and, you know, pickings and, pickings and chigs, pigs and chickens, that, that stuff. Um, theory X, theory Y, all these, all these kind of things, you know, them and us. You know, and, or would you think, well, actually, here's a guy who really gets it. Here's someone who's committed uh, to having teams that improve. Here's, a, here's, here's someone who understands how that change process works and so on and so on and so on. I am very much in that category, that second category. I hope that most of you are too. I'm not going to embarrass anyone by asking for a, for a show of hands. Um, but I think, um, you know, this, this knocking of leadership and management that we see in some quarters is, is quite unnecessary and unhelpful. And part of starting, you know, the part of start with what you do now is, is having a method that works in your current context. Um, you can ask yourself whether this would work or not work in your context. So that's leadership. Um, customer focus, flow, and leadership. But when we looked at the first three, I said these map very easy to what you do now, and they're very easy to implement on top of what you do now. I actually think that these are a little bit different to that. You know, we're starting to think about some of the things that David talked about this morning, the service orientation agenda. Um, rather than, for example, a team-focused agenda or a purely customer-focused agenda or a purely product-focused agenda or a purely technology-focused agenda. Um, this is something that's rather more holistic than that. It addresses different stakeholder groups and encourages behaviour that benefits, definitely benefits the customer and the team. Um, but also we recognise that developing capability in the organisation, developing, for example, leadership, is an important thing to be doing if we're building for the long term. So that's direction. And lastly, discipline. I think about 10 minutes left, is that right? Right, okay. So, I've said this already, start with what you do now. And this is all about understanding. Start with what you do now, understanding how it serves and frustrates the customer, how it works and fails to work for you, for, for you inside the system, and how it might be changed safely. All about understanding. Um, when, we, you know, when we're teaching Kanban, we're teaching how to start this process off, how to catalyse the process with the right amount of understanding of your current context. It's actually helpful to understand what a lack of understanding looks like and how harmful it can be. Um, two words. Um, the first one is due to Deming. Uh, the numbers are, there are some references at the back of the deck, so when I publish this, you can, you can read these up. Um, tampering is Deming's word for change that's made without understanding. You just intervene in the system, intervene in the system. You know, whenever something bad happens, oh, we must never let that happen again. We must change the system. And you get policy piled up in policy, and the system, after a while, creaks under its own weight. Um, another one is bravado, which, you know, making change 
faster than your, capabili your capability is capable of sustaining and actually leading people and the organisation into a situation of um, you know, danger, safety, compromising the safety of people and the company. And a good way to look at this is the J-curve. Um, lots of people have J-curves. The, the, the Satya one is the famous one. Um, but I'm just looking at a couple of parameters. It gets worse before it gets better. That's true of most change. Sometimes it gets catastrophically worse before it get, gets better. And really, it's a question of safety. And the next question, do we have time for this? Um, Multi-month, multi-year change initiatives have a horrible track record. Um, some consultancies know this, and they make sure they make enough money in the first few months of the change initiative that it won't matter that they get kicked out. Um, so if we get to here, and we haven't seen any benefit yet, if we're past the, the patient threshold of the organisation, what usually happens is the change agent gets fired. Now, um, you know, if it's a consultancy, that's something they expect, and, and in a way, no harm done. Um, if it's you in the organisation and you get fired, that's not a good place to be. The possible upside is you get promoted instead, uh, moved out of harm's way, uh, but I think that's a bit rarer. So, um, understanding. Uh, I haven't gone into, into all of these. Um, this is all about uh, you know, where we're starting from. And then agreement. Agree to pursue evolutionary change. Um, I'm not going to spend too much on evolutionary change and actually major on the agreement part. And... It's all about you know, how, you know, what's the right sort of you know, mindset to approach as, as you, you're approaching change. And if all you're asking for is agreement from people that this is the way to do it, um, I think you're going to find that very diff difficult. We need agreement between people that says, right, this is the problem. You know, we think that this, of, of the solutions that we've considered, this is the best one and we can move forward. We can agree to move forward on that, that basis. Um, you know, the difference between in principle, uh, agreement in principle, agreement in practice. A bit less of this. Now, I've, I, to my embarrassment, you know, in some of my older material, you know, I've, I've used this picture, and I now disagree with it. In this picture, you're the hero in the middle of the change process, and your job is to find out what the customers need, to find out what the people who are going to be impacted by the change are going to have to go through, and to persuade them of, uh, persuade them of the merits of the change that you've uh, um, proposed, um, you know, the, uh, the higher organisation, uh, the feedback systems that I talked about and so on, um, you know, we, need to, we, need, we, need their, we want their support, uh, we need to make sure that we're not going in a direction that's going to be, you know, uh, hindered by the system um, and so on and so on. But anyway, the key point of this is that you are the hero in the middle of this change, you're the change agent um, with some sort of uh, Superman badge on your chest. And what we actually need is groups of people understanding what needs to be done. And the more that the change is done by the people who are feeling the pain, understand the roots of that, that pain, understand what needs to be done, understand what can be done, the, you know, in other words, the instigators of the change, those impacted, the implementers of the change, those designing the change, the more they are the same people, the easier change is going to be. And if we keep doing it, Instead of one big J-curve, you know, we have lots of little J-curves. Um, and this is kind of what evolutionary change look, look, looks like. We get increasingly more fit. And we're building our capability for change because we're getting used to this process. We're getting used to, for example, gaining agreement. And is Andy Carmichael in the room? Or is he upstairs? He must be upstairs. He uh, recently said evolutionary change is going from a survivable point to a survivable point, um, which, is, which is really good. Uh, and I would add to that, and you need to survive the journey as well. So, you know, the, uh, the, the, the scope, the scale of your change needs to be calibrated according to your, you know, your current ca capability. So that's agreement. And the last one's respect. Initially, respect current roles, responsibilities, and job titles. This is actually just smart change management, but I love the that it has the word respect in it. Um, and respect for people is obviously a, is, you know, for, for many, many years has been a key pillar of, of lean. Respecting job titles, I and mean, we had this from David this morning, going into a situation saying, we don't need project managers anymore, is probably, you know, quite a difficult way to start a change initiative in an in organisation that's full of project managers, just to take a quite common example. 
And I just want to emphasize that this has been in Kanban from the very beginning. And um, this is a talk from, these are extracts from a talk uh, given by David right back at the formation of what was then called the Lean Software Systems Consortium, the LSSC, is now the LSS. Um, I'll just give you a moment to read that for yourselves. I won't, won't read it out. So point out the Yes We Can, I should have worn my Yes We Can Man t-shirt. Um, that's Taiichi Ona, the uh, Toyota guy on the t-shirt. Um, but the Yes We Can Man message was from around the time of you know, Obama's campaign. So this is, this is not a new message. You know, this, is, this is a message that's been around since the you know, mid-2000s. Mid and respect, it really, you know, this is, um, I owe this one to Liz, who's in the room. Um, respect is the test. You know, if we're making change disrespectfully, we're doing something wrong. But we should also ask, you know, are we actually encouraging humane things, respectful things? And again, without going into detail, I would argue that these values are doing exactly that. You know, do we want pe people to be able to see what, what challenges facing them, for example? Do we, do we want people to be... Do we want to avoid overburdening people, to take two, two very simple examples? And clearly, well I, well, I certainly, I'm on the side of doing the respectful, humane thing, rather than the dis disrespectful, you know, we'll deliver at all costs thing. So, discipline three, respect. Initially, respect current roles, responsibility and job titles. Those three values together I call disciplines because I think it actually takes discipline to insist that change is always based on understanding always implemented with agreement and is based on respect. And I sort of asked the slightly rhetorical question, what difference would it make to your organisation if your world, if your initiative was protected by those three values? And who would you need agreement on those three values from in order to make a you know, profound difference to your organisation? And it gets to Kanban's third agenda, which really is about leadership, change, culture, those, those, those kind of things, safety as well. Um, so three agendas, improvement, service orientation, and this one, leadership and change, and so on. So what is Kanban? Um, I really am wrapping up now. It's the humane, start with what you do now, approach to change. I hope I've convinced you of the humane part. Uh, the start with what you do now thing, that's just part of the official canon. That was easy. easy. Hopefully I've given you some insight building on what David has said already this morning on what evolutionary change is all about. Um, so I'll just leave you with, with a reflection. I'd just like to ask you to think, of these nine, can you pick three that resonate with you most strongly? And, they could and for whatever reason, whether that's because uh, they, you think, yes, that's me, or whether you think, crikey, our, our organisation really needs a bit of that. So those three, just look at that for a moment. We'll come back to it. Um, I'll come back to that as well. So there are references are on the deck. Uh, so I'll publish this on uh, on SlideShare. Well, I'll put it on Dropbox first. After the, the Hamburg conference next week, I'll put the, the deck on SlideShare. Some thank yous, including to some people that are in the room and to some people that are upstairs. You know, this I haven't done this entirely on my own. I've had lots of feedback on this stuff over the uh, over the months. Uh, I think we'll see Liz's name there. I don't know if anybody else in the room whose name is there, but seek them out upstairs. Um, so, some homework. I've created a web website, um, slightly hubristically. I called it um, not something kanban -y, but something else, because I thought I was a stupid thing, given what I've just said, building a platform. I thought everyone would be really excited about um, the way I built this website, um, which was quite stupid of me. Um, but what it is... All it is really is a description of Kanban, the method, and the values. And the, the idea is that you um, identify in your profile those three values that resonate strongly with you. And I would encourage you also to submit stories that support those values as well. Um, there's about 50, 50 members on there so far. Um, when I finish my book, or when I get close to finishing my book, um, you will um, receive access to content based on those values and so on and so on and so on. So that's, that's where I'm heading with this stuff. Um, and that's it. Uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah. We have a couple of minutes for questions. That's good. So I'll say, I'll, I'll leave with you. Thank you. How about that? <laughs> thank you. Questions? <laughs> Hi. Yep. So uh, my client has um, developers kind of offshore in the Isle of Man or in America, and they kind of work as one-man projects.
Yes. Um, what would you typically do with, do with in that situation? Would you have them kind of on the Kanban board, or how, how would you manage that? Yeah, so for the benefit of the camera, we had a question about um, how you deal with multi-site working and visibility. Um, there's a couple of good answers to that. Um, I said I was working in Budapest. Uh, I was working there for about 18 months, and I was working a week on, a week off in Budapest, and then the rest of the time from home. Um, as well as doing IT directory type things, I was also doing a lot of development. You know, I still enjoy programming. I probably did more programming than I should have done. Um, but I had work on the Kanban board, and that board was done with a whiteboard and sticky notes. Um, we also tracked work in a tracking system, and uh, we, used, uh, we used Track, uh, the open source um, you know, ticketing system. And every time a piece of work changed, changed state, we updated it in track, and I got the email so I could see the flow of changes coming from the team members, um, and they saw mine. Or, or I would chat people on Skype saying, you know, I've, I've just done this, can you move this sticky to this column? So the rest of the team had visibility of what I was doing. That's one technique. There are more modern versions of that involve cameras trained on the board and using Skype or something like that to, uh, to relay it from one location to another, and a number of teams have done that. Um, Ian Carroll, who is here, um, showed me that in action at uh, one of his companies. Um, and arguably the most modern solution, uh, but electronic tools aren't for everybody, is to use an electronic tool that just you know, is web-based and it allows people to make their changes and see other people's changes from wherever they are. Um, so we have, you know, we have uh, Swift Kanban here, um, Linkit, those, those kind of tools, multi-user tools that just make it very easy for teams to share work in a, in a Kanban system. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we've time for one more. Yep. Tell me if there have been any other, any other observations around engaging the customer in this process. Yes. Uh, I suppose I'm talking about more traditional uh, organisations. Yes. Traditional customers. Yes. Um, uh, I think it's best to answer that question from personal experience. And there's some, some positives and negatives from my, my hungry experience. Um, I was uh, brought in, um, you know, obviously I was brought in to, to, to do a job. And I understood that job was to, to, to deliver some projects that, that were going a bit too slowly. And I had time with the company before I formally joined to get the lie of the land, understand how things were. Um, I had very strong support from the MD from, from, from the beginning. Um, and that was really, really good. So, you know, I kind of had the buy-in from the beginning just by, just, just thanks to, to my role. I was, you know, I was brought in to do that. Um, a mistake I made um, is, was that I treated the MD as the customer. And he, he, he was the, the guy who founded the company originally. You know, he had most of the ideas. Um, he had outlined what the new system would do, and he was excited about it. And a lot of people were excited about it. Um, but I didn't do a good enough job early enough to engage the people impacted by the new system. I didn't do enough to treat them as customers. I didn't work hard enough on the agreement thing um, to get them comfortable with what I was doing, not just in terms of building the system, but also in terms of the changes I brought with me in terms of process and things as well. Um, so one of my motivations for, for um, you know, looking at Kanban through values was looking at some of the um, principles you know, and summarizing them in three words, understanding, agreement, and respect. You know, I've been doing this for, for a couple of years and then realizing to my shame and embarrassment that you know, perhaps I actually hadn't lived those values quite as, as, as well as I, I could have done myself. Um, so you can think of these as just little reminders. Um, uh, and in terms of that versus traditional change management, I think so much of traditional change management is about persuasion. And I'll just get start thinking in terms of agreement rather than persuasion. And, you know, agreement most easily happens when, you know, a, a large part of the idea for change comes from the people who are, who are impacted by it, rather than you as the change agent. So get away from change agent as hero and try to change agent as facilitator, perhaps. Yeah. Does that help? So I think we're done. Thank you very much.